think this is your first Sabbath back. Second, second. 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 All right. Yes. Um, yes. It is. Uh, it is still good to have you back at church uh, after the the. As we know, we had to stay at home for for a couple of weeks, close to the whole of July. We stayed at home, and uh, but we thank God that we are still back. And actually, I've seen that, I've seen faces that I haven't seen in a while, and we still thank God that He has kept us. You know, uh, before I start with my message, you know the thing is with uh, COVID-19, the way it has been, it's such that you see a person today, uh, or you talk to them, whether you see them on social media, and then the next thing a message comes and says, oh, that person, and then you, th you, th you think to yourself, but that person was healthy. That person was, you know, uh, still good, but it's such the time that we're living in, you know. That is why it is important, I believe, that you, if, if you have somebody to tell that you love them, say it. Amen. If you have affection to show to someone, Do it. show it. Mm. Uh, if you have to pay somebody, if you owe somebody, pay them. Mm. There's nothing more painful than, you know, you're attending a funeral of a person that you owe money or owes you money, mm. you know. But um, I think the important thing, if one of the lessons, life lessons that we're learning from COVID-19, that don't delay, um, don't delay anything. Um, even your dreams, if you want to pursue something, pursue it. If you want to do anything, do it. If you want to live for God, do it. Don't wait for tomorrow. For tomorrow may never come. You know, when COVID started, they said the, the people who are most at risk are the 60 and above. Mm. And some of us uh, who are still within our 30s, we thought, ah, I'm fine. But then a few weeks ago, we were just burying friends. Some are third, in their early 30s, some are in their late 20s. And then now you realize that, oh man, this is bad. You take a vaccine, some people get sick. Anyway, I'm not here about vaccines, you know, that's a personal, personal thing. Anyway, anyway, um, the text for today, what we are going to, I, I, I promise you I won't take too long. It's found there in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10, verse 15. Romans chapter 10, verse 15. Uh, Romans, I'm reading it from the New King James Version. Romans chapter 10. Verse 15, I'll read it in your hearing. And it says, How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good, the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. I'll read it again. How shall they preach unless they have been sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for what you have done for us. We thank you for what you continue to do in our lives. And Lord, as we begin this study of your word, we ask that you be with us, transcend this message Transform our lives and let us be like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The, the title of the message of which I will be preaching under is entitled The Belly of the Beast. The Belly of the Beast. Of course, the Belly of the Beast, it is a colloquial, it is a phrase that is used generally by people who are trying to depict something terrible that is happening to someone. But most importantly, it is meaning, especially within our religious uh, circles, that we do believe that the devil exists. And so, when the phrase belly of the beast, meaning being in the, pist, uh, in the pits of hell and still being able to thrive. Because when you are thrown in hell, you are expected to fail. But when you thrive in hell, it means you are thriving in the belly of the beast. I'll give you an example. If you are a football man just like myself, you would remember that a few weeks ago we were watching the Euro 2020 that was happening in Europe. 
Now, in the final, as some of you might have known, it was a, a, a final match between England and Italy. Now, England, on one hand, they've played most of their matches in England, in London. They had the support, they had everything. In fact, whenever they played at home, England, towards leading towards the Euros, they were sensational. Any team, uh, their bench, their members, their players, everybody thought that this was England's um, tournament to lose because they were so sensational. And then other teams like Italy, Belgium, uh, Wales, they had to travel all over Europe where they had to be played. And so one commentator was saying that if in the final, because Italy had made it to the final, and as they were going, the final was held in London at the Wembley Stadium. And so one commentator, as they were commentating towards the leading, the building up to the game, he was saying that if Italy were to win it, they have to win it in the belly of the beast. Why? Because, number one, England had the support. They had the spectators. Secondly, they were at home. And as you know, when you have home ground advantage, you are expected to thrive. Another example, for most of us also who like sports, like the rugby, you will know that in these past couple of weeks, the three weeks, we had the British and Irish Lion coming to South Africa. <coughs> the first game was bad. We were bad, the bots. We were terrible. I watched that game halfway. I switched on my TV and went home. Uh, I went to sleep. But the second game, the box started playing. And so again, the commentators are saying of the match that will be playing this evening, they are saying, if the Irish and British Lions are to win in South Africa, they will have to do it in the belly of the beast. Now, as you would understand that the belly of the beast, it is a situation that when you are placed in, you are expected to fail, but somehow you thrive. As a people, as people that we've been living in this world, we do understand that what it is to thrive in the belly of the beast. For most of us, know that we are in hostile environments. Your manager is giving you help. The principal is giving you help. The children at school are giving you help. But somehow you are making it work because you are thriving in the belly of the beast. Because as we, uh, as believers of God, we know that we have been made more than conquerors and therefore we are supposed to thrive in the belly of the beast. I mean, we're living in an economy which is failing. Just a couple of days ago, there was a change in government. And as the change was happening, the reshuffling, we saw the rent tanking because the Minister of Finance was changed. And people were saying that for South Africa to make it, meaning everybody has to work hard, which means we have to thrive in the belly of the beast. COVID-19 came. We never expected it for the devastation it causes. But for those of us who are still here, we have to make it work in the belly of the beast. Some of you, you know, that you've been faced in COVID-19 with a loss of income. You did not know or you do not know what to put together. For what you thought you had, COVID came and take it away. And now you have to thrive in the belly of the beast. Some of us have lost employment. Things are not working out. You wonder what are your children are going to make. But I'm here to remind you, my brothers and sisters, that for you to make it, you are going to make it. How? Because we serve a God who is stronger than your problem. One writer says that don't tell God how big the mountain is, but rather tell the mountain how big your God is. Because in spite of the belly of the beast being in, we know that we are going to thrive because God is fighting on our side. David says, or rather Paul, that if God be for us, then who can stand against us? Are we still together, my brothers and sisters? Amen. And so we are in the belly of the beast. But in spite of being in the belly of the beast, we should know. And I'm here to assure you as we are trying to piece together this life that we do not know it's going to be like, this future that has so many unprecedented things, one thing we should know that we are going to thrive in the belly of the beast. We might see, it might look that we are outnumbered. It might feel that things are going against us. It might feel that you are pressed against the wall. But you should know that God created you not to break, but to thrive in the belly of the beast. You would remember the story of the three Hebrew boys. 
They were in the belly of the beast. Nebuchadnezzar had, had, had set up a statue. He said, please, they're telling everybody that they should worship the statue. But these boys chose differently because in every circumstances that you go through, you have to choose how to react to it. You see, the difference in life is not so much what you face, but rather how you react to the circumstances. Many of us fail along the wayside, not because things are hard, but simply because we fail to react in a way that is supposed to meet the challenge. So these boys, by all intents and purposes, they were faced with a challenge to say, look, we have been taken from our homeland. We've been put in the belly of the beast. On top of it, we have been emasculated, which means we cannot proceed with our seed. Yet, they chose to react differently. One person always told me, a friend of mine who is a pastor said, listen, you know, uh, when he was growing up, he says, because uh, I was asking him and I was saying to, to him, uh, he was telling him, me about a circumstances or a situation where he's, um, as he was growing up uh, at school, uh, people swore at him. You know, when, when, when we, we, we grow up, there's this thing of swearing. You know, kids, I don't know where, but there's a phase where kids start swearing. You know, they swear like, Peter, uh, before he met Jesus, and, and and so and so, so I used to tell him because he used to say I, I, he was telling me that he never gets phased when people swear at him, and I said how you know because if somebody swears at me, you know something boils in me. You know when you are driving, and somebody gives drives nonsense in front of you. You know, uh, not all of us are sanctified when we are on the roads. You know, so, so some of us we have to be a, a, a different breed. And so when I was asking him, say, how do you handle life under pressure? He says, you know, the lesson that he learned when he was growing up, he says his mother, when kids saw at him at school, and they saw at him using his mother, and as he went home, he was so, he was crying and he was going through the emotions and he told his mother, said, oh, these boys at school saw at me. And, 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 and the mother said, so what? He says, but they saw at me. And he says, so what? And he says, oh, okay. And then, did, and then the mother says, did the swear word change your skin color? And then he says, no. Did the swear word change uh, your height? He says, no. Did the swear word change anything about you? He says, no. And then he says, exactly. These are just words. They are, they are not going to change everything. And most importantly, how you react, it will define how these words are going to be like to you. Mm. So for us to thrive in the belly of the beast is not so much what the belly, or what, rather what the beast is throwing at us. For us to thrive in the belly of the beast is reacting in a positive way while we are facing adversity. Because this is what makes conquerors. You know, when the stories of COVID are written, when stories, when people or the historians are going to be chronically killing all the things that happened in these last two years, they're not really going to, yes, they're going to focus on the deaths, they're going to focus on the infections, but most importantly, what they are going to focus on is what people did in the belly of the beast, is what, how we chose to persevere in the belly of the beast is how churches returned while things were scary. I'm not going to lie, it is scary sometimes to come to church because you might come healthy, but then as soon as you get to church, you might go home sick. But still we do it, not because we believe that, that, that things are, the devil is in control. We do it because we know that God is in control, that even though things may go bad, but still this is not the end. This is how we thrive in the belly of the beast is we persevere even when circumstances tell us to stop. Mm. Are we still together? Yeah. No, I know you, you are no longer used to saying amen because you've been, you've been at home virtual worship. So I get it. I understand. I understand. Now let's get into the book. Now the book of Romans as, 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 as the text that we've written. Now it is a book that Paul wrote to the Christians who were in Rome. He was in Corinth writing to the saints in Rome. Now you have to understand in the time of Paul that his times were not, uh, it was not okay. The, the Christian movement was a threat to the state. 
that they looked as the Romans at the time, the empire of the time, when they looked at this movement, whom they were holding up a savior, who they killed but resurrected. So automatically, everybody who was following Christ was a threat to the state. Because if you understand that if you have a leader who cannot be killed, which means you have a movement that cannot be stopped. Are we still together? See, this is what made Christ a threat to the state. Because as they were following him, it gave them a new assurance that even though you may kill us, we have a leader who is powerful enough even unto death. Because up to that time, the most feared thing in, in, in the world was death. Because they knew if I kill you, which means the movement stops. But then if you have a leader who is not scared of death, and we've seen him resurrect, we, we, we lynched him on the cross, eh? we, we pierced his side, he bled, he died, but then on the third day he resurrected, which means anybody who's following him, as Jesus has said, that even though you may die, but I'll still raise you up, which means he was raising an army that cannot be defeated. I was still together. So, 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 so now, when Paul was writing to the Christians in Rome, they were in the belly of the beast, because now, how do you worship a risen savior and still be in the enemy's territory. I was still together. It becomes a difficult thing. And so when Paul was writing to the Christian, uh, to the Christians in Rome, he was giving them assurances that even though you might be in the belly of the beast, understand one thing: that in order for you to thrive, you do not need the mechanisms of the day. You don't need an army. You don't need weapons in order for you to thrive. But the things that you need, these are the things that nobody can take away from you. And so that is why when Paul starts the book of, the, of, of Romans, he talks about justification by faith. He says, listen, they can take anything from you, but one thing they can't take is your faith. Are we still together? Okay. That these things are stick and stones. They can throw you in prison. This it was like a testimony of Paul that, hey, at one point in Philippi, I was thrown in prison with my, co, uh, with my colleague Silas. But as we were in prison, because our faith was connected to God, we were able to shake the prison bars because our faith is strong enough to talk to heaven and let us go. Are we still together? Meaning that the world or the belly or the beast can do anything to you, but one thing that they cannot take away from you is your faith. And so when Paul was saying that we are justified by faith, we are made stronger by faith, because faith is, is believing in things that are not seen, but you have the evidence because you know the one that you worship is much stronger than your circumstances. Are we still together? So that is why we believe. We look, you know, we, when we believe in God, it's not that we believe in God because we've seen Him. None of us have seen God. None of us have heard His voice. We don't even know what God sounds like. But we, 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 we believe that God exists because we've seen Him, how He has worked in our lives, in circumstances when it looked dire, when everybody said that you will never escape here. As soon as we put you here, you will never get out of it. But somehow God worked in mysterious ways. You are here today. You have a testimony because you've seen how God worked. Some of us were in troublesome relationships. Everybody thought that the way for you to get out was death. But somehow the hand of grace moved things around, shifted things around. Now you are here. You have a testimony. So when Paul talks about faith, he was saying, man, what we are holding on to, it's not things that are seen by the world. I don't have to put God in a test tube, in a lab, for you to prove to me, to prove to you that God exists. It's simply by mere fact that I am alive. Is risen enough to me to know that God exists. Are we still together? Mm -hmm. And so when Paul was talking, he was saying, man, we are justified by faith. Faith not only gives us strength to go on, but it justifies us. Because as soon as I'm connected with heaven, all my circumstances change. Faith gives us a clean slate. Are we still together? Mm -hmm. now, 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 you see, when, 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 when you talk about clean slate, Christianity is the only religion I know. Maybe there are others I do not know. Maybe I am yet to understand them. But Christianity is one religion that gives you an opportunity to start fresh. It gives you a clean slate. Christianity, or rather the power of God, 
When, when you come to God, God does not, number one, ask you where you've been. God is not concerned about your past. And that is why when you read the book of uh, oh, the prodigal son, when, when the son comes back home, the father is not asking the son that where have you been? Because the father was not concerned about the past. Because the past cannot affect your future unless you, you let your past affect your future. Some of us would be walking the streets if it was not for God. But because God loves us so much, when he brought us in, he never asked us where we are coming from. He never asked us that the things we did, all the things we did, God is not concerned about. So that is why Christianity has so much power that God overlooks the things that we've done, but he takes us as we are because he takes the shapeless form that we were and he makes us into a beautiful thing. That is why when you read Genesis chapter 1, God, when he was creating the heavens and earth, he takes a, vo a void and formless world, he turns it upside down and makes it beautiful. And then God, at the end, he says, everything looks good. So meaning with your life, it does not matter how shapeless and formless you were without God. But as soon as God grabs hold of you, he changes everything. He cuts away the things that you don't need. And then at the end, God says, it's good. Are we still together? And so that is why when Paul, and then secondly, in the book of Romans, Paul talks about the freedom of salvation. You know, when you believe in God, God, or rather the experience of salvation, it is supposed to make us free to live. Because God, Jesus has said, I have come so that they can have life and have it more abundantly. Because in the previous sentence, God says, the thief comes to destroy and to steal. But I have come that they have life and have it more abundantly. So meaning, according to that text, Christians, we are supposed to be the most free, happy people that you will ever experience. But somehow, down the line, I do not know where we lost it. Sometimes Christians are the most miserable people that you will ever encounter. Because we spend so much time worrying about the things we are not supposed to worry about, looking at other people's lives, judging everybody, critiquing everybody, and not focusing on yourself. Because when you keep on looking at other people, you will not know where you are going. And that is why when we come to church, our most focused thing is to look up to Jesus. And that is why I, I love the song we said, my faith looks up to thee. Because our most uh, a critical thing that we should do whenever we come to church is for us to look up to Jesus because by beholding him we become changed but if you keep on looking at other people you will always be miserable because when you look at other people you become envious because you'll have things that you'll hate about them thinking that they should be about you so this is why in the Ten Commandments God says do not envy because you do not know the struggle that it took for the other person to be where they are. That is why you cannot, you cannot envy your neighbor's car, you cannot envy your neighbor's house, you cannot envy, envy somebody's faith because you do not know the struggle they have to go through. We, what we are only seeing is the end result, but you do not know the struggle. Sometimes I, I used to do this, then I would see a beautiful preacher preaching and I would be so envious. I wish I preached that, that. And then, uh, you know, sometimes with preachers, the thing is, I, I, I talk to them. You know, if I know him, I'll talk to them. And then one, a, a friend of mine, he's, he's from Zim, but right now he's in Indonesia. As I was interacting with him, because he was a powerful preacher, I love how he preached. And then the more time I spent with him, I saw the struggle that he went through in order for him to be that preacher. From that day, I stopped envying. If I see somebody doing something beautiful, I say, praise God. Yeah. Because the strength, the struggle that it takes for somebody to be where they are. You can look at your neighbor and you think your neighbor, they've got it, put it together. Because we come in our suits, we come in our ties, looking good. But you do not know the struggle. And so that is why when God says, the experience of salvation, it should make you free. Free to be who you are. Free to, to express yourself in God. Because if you cannot express the gift of salvation, then who are you going to express it to? Because our experience of salvation, it should tell everybody else 
then actually, look, the Christian walk is not easy, but it can be done. This is our message, that the Christian walk is not easy, but it can be done. Because the moment we live fake lives, as soon as people get to experience us, they'll say, no man, this is not it. But if they see, even the struggles, they see what we go through to be where we are, they'll be inspired to say, this life can be lived. And so, and so Paul was saying to the Christians in Rome, he said, even though you might be in the belly of the beast, but don't be afraid to live out your faith. Don't be undercover agents where you are only a Christian in certain spaces. That you are only a Christian on Sabbath. That you are only a, 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 where we, you know, you know, you know, Chris, some of us. There are some of us who eat meat. Like they are carnivores. Now, I'm not here to judge people who eat meat. It's, it's your personal choice. But there are some of us who are carnivores in private. But in public, we like to tell people, oh, I'm a vegetarian. But then when you look at this person's body structure, it's like, no, man, we know vegetarians are. <laughs> are we still together? It's like, we know what vegetarians look like. And this one does not look like. But they, because now you, you, because when you are not living freely, you will always struggle to present a message. You know, a few, a few, a few, a few months ago, as soon as this uh, 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 economy was opening, so came these people who sell, you know, face uh, creams and, and, and whatnot. So they knocked, they came, and I sat them down and was talking and says, and they says, yeah, Pastor, I'm here to sell uh, these, uh, these, these creams and everything. And then I said, okay, cool. And then, you see, I, I didn't have a problem with the creams. For all, it looked good. But then the, the, the problem with the cream is that as I was looking at the salesperson, it seemed that the cream was not working on him or her. Because <laughs> they were saying, no, this, this, this lotion, as soon as you put it on, you know, the, the, it will take away, your skin will be glowing, you won't have pimples, you won't have blemishes, everything will be glowing, even showing me pamphlets and brochures. And, and then I was like, man, this looks good. But then when I look at you, this, there's something wrong. Either you're not using this product to that you are endorsing. Mm. So that's what Paul was trying to say. That this product, the good news mm. that we are selling, we, it should work for us mm. before it can work for someone else. Mm. You can't tell a person that Jesus saved, but Jesus has not saved you. Mm. Because how are you going to testify about the goodness of Jesus in your life when it seems that he's not working in you? How you treat other people should testify that Jesus has saved you. It's not something we don't just become Adventists when we are holding crusades. That, oh, we, now we are... We should be Adventists throughout. It should be a lifestyle. And then what Paul was trying to tell in the belly of the beast, in order for you to defeat the beast, live free. You should know that you are saving a risen Lord. Because as you are serving a risen Lord, things are going to be good for you. And so another thing is, I'm, I'm just going to cut it down and then go to the text and then finish up. Paul was also writing to the Jews and Gentiles. He was saying, you guys, you have to understand one thing. That in Christ, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile. Because God has chosen us. You know, when you read the book of Ephesians, Paul is trying to say that we are here simply because God chose us. You know the, the, the beautiful thing of being chosen? And, 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 and this is married people, they would understand it even better than us who are single Christian. Yeah? They would understand it how? Because, you know, for you to be married, they, they, there's this thing getting married, that on the wedding day, white dress, nice suit, we have a party, it's nice. That's a wedding. Everybody can do that. Even a poor person can get married. But to stay married, it means you have to choose your partner every day. You have to wake up in the morning, make a conscious decision that as soon as you're looking at your partner sleeping and they're drooling, but you still have to make a decision that in spite of what they look like, I choose this person. That even though you get into fights and, 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 and your personalities, they come out, but in spite of all of that, you should always, you always remember that as much as we might be fighting, either how we use finances, how you do things, maybe how you cook pap, or how you do this, or how you do that, and everything. But in spite of all of this, I'm still 
staying with you because I chose you. Are we still together? That, that you, you hear testimonies of people who've been married for 50, 60 years. They'll tell you that, you know what? My husband or my wife, or most wives, they say this, that my husband was not the most handsome guy. They'll say, he wasn't handsome. Uh, and especially the, 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 the poor that I had to choose. I didn't choose him because of his uh, athletic build or his handsome features, none of that. I chose him because I wanted him. It was specifically him. I cannot explain it, but I just chose him. So it's the same thing with God. That God does not choose us because we are better. It's not because we have done anything. It's not as we walk on the street, there's something about us. God chose us. He chose us in spite of ourselves. And so when Paul was saying that as Jews and Gentiles don't discriminate, Jews don't discriminate Gentiles, Gentiles don't discriminate Jews, because we are all chosen by God. As if we are chosen by God, God chose us when the world was hating us. And, 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 and so when Paul was talking, it, it's the same thing even here at church. We are here simply because God chose us. And that should give you a confidence, a level of confidence that's beyond everything. You know, that you should wake up in the morning, as you are getting ready for work, you look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? I don't care what the world says. God chose me. Imagine the supreme ruler of the universe, who can choose so many people, who has responsibilities of galaxies of galaxies, but God still chose you. Because he chose you, you walk like a conqueror. That even though when people are talking about you, he says you don't know anything. That's why when John writes, he says the world does not know you because it never knew him. You see, as you are seeing me today, you don't know me. But, but John says, but when he shall appear, I shall be like him. Why? Because he chose me. Amen. So we are chosen. We are chosen people. And then living a transformation life, and I think I've spoken about it. So now when we go to the text, I've only got 10 minutes and then I'm done. Now, when Paul says, how shall now they preach unless they've been sent? Now, how do you preach in the belly of the beast? Because we have problems sometimes that there are certain people who are supposed to be preaching, but they are not preaching. And those who are not supposed to be preaching, those are the ones preaching. So Paul outlining the whole system in Rome and the whole experience of the gospel, Paul is saying that our preaching, number one, it should not be based on the acceptance or our rejection. That we should never care whether the world accepts us or not or rejects us. We should preach in season or out of season. Our preaching should not be that I'm only preaching to the people who will accept the gospel. Because when I'm, once I'm doing that, now I am handpicking people who are candidates of heaven. Whereas all of us are candidates of heaven. So when Paul says, how shall they preach? Now you preach even when things are bad. You know, I remember my, my experience when I just released my book. Um, I think it was 2017. Now, one of the things that I enjoyed, at first I did not like it. But I ended up enjoying it. I would always now, between, between Monday and uh, Thursdays. Uh, what I enjoyed doing was going to people's homes, knocking on the doors, and selling my book. Now, you know, it was different because we know here at church we have a corporate ministry, the publishing ministry, where you, you are selling health books, Ellen White books, but now this time I'm selling my book. So now, when you sell your book, it's different. Because as I'm give, if I'm giving you uh, Desire of Ages, uh, I don't have, to, I can just endorse the message and say, I, I read it, you know, she's a good writer, blah, 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 and everything. But now, when you are selling something that you've written, every time you sell to a person, they have a right to question you about what you've written. Mm -hmm. So, which means you have, you're endorsing that you've written. So, so one of the things used to happen, I, 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 I would knock at people's homes. And, and another thing, I was not going to, like, uh, in the township. I was here in town. Ivory Hills, Gates, Wolfstead. You know, and, and if you live, you know that we are high walled gated communities. So it's unlike when you go to the township, you can just go and knock on somebody's front door, they let you in. Now you ring the bell at the, at the gate. Hmm. You know, they have the right to. So now, the beautiful thing now, as I learned, one of the things I learned was that I had to 
As soon as somebody I knock on the bell, they answer the call, I had to be in a space of two seconds, three seconds, or even five seconds. I had to promote my book, promote myself, speak well, not stammer, speak in a flowing English, you know, so that as you are hearing this, you'll be like, okay, I think I need to let him in. So, 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 it is the same thing when you are preaching about God. It's like, it should the gospel be as if you wrote it, that you endorse the message, that as anybody who asks you about your Jesus, it should be that you have a personal relationship with Jesus, such that when somebody asks you about Jesus, you are not even phased to say, okay, uh, uh, when somebody asks you a thing about Jesus, you'll be like, oh, okay, uh, let me make an appointment. It should be on the spot because you know Jesus. Are we still together? That as, as you are selling them the gospel, you, it's not something that you say, oh, my pastor said this the other day. No, it should be what you have gone through. That makes the message powerful. So when Paul says, how, they should, how shall they preach? And then the second part, Paul says, unless they've been sent. Hmm. Now, another thing. When, when you've been sent, for instance, when a parent sends a child to the shops, uh, especially when some of us who grew up in the township, one of the things that used to happen is that uh, you had these shops, you know, the community shops, tuck shops, and in those community tuck shops, uh, you, you didn't always pay in cash, but you, 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 you bought in credit, you know, uh, because it was a close-knit community. You go to the shop, you, 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 you get milk, you get bread, you get whatever, they'll write you down, you have a tab. Nowadays, we don't have tabs, because people never attend things. But then, you had a tab. So sometimes, normally it was the adults who went, because there was that, if you're an adult, which means you work, you have the money, you paid later, it's just the, the month is a bit tight. Nowadays you have credit cards, so things are okay. So, so there will be times though, when the parent can't go to the shop, and then they'll send a child, they would write a note, they'll say uh, to the shopkeeper, uh, please, I need milk, bread, whatever, and then they'll put their signature. And then they'll put the note with the child. A child, barely four or six years old, will go to the shop. The child won't even say anything. Will say, my mommy, my daddy sent me this. And then the shopkeeper would take the note, would read it, and because there's a signature here, meaning the child has been empowered to get whatever, because the one who sent him with that signature empowers the child to get whatever, even without money. Are we still together? Mm -hmm. Now, now when, when, when Paul says, how shall they preach unless they've been sent? Now, when you preach the gospel and you've been sent, God gives you the power to go, which means whatever obstacles you are facing, they will never be a factor because God has underwritten you with his signature. So that when people see you, they don't see you, but they see God. Because as we are taking the notes to, to, to buy on credit, the shopkeeper did not look at the child, but the shopkeeper, through the child, saw the father. So because they have a relationship with the father, they gave you whatever you needed. So when you are going, God has made ways for you to go. So that whatever comes along the way, it will never be a problem. So that is why, as, 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 as ministers or preachers of the gospel, we should never be worried about how are we going to live. Because if God has sent you, he will make a way for you. Because God is a miracle worker, he makes a way out of nowhere. So which means whenever the storms of life come, you will never be hindered because God makes a way for you. Even when, when you come to God, you know the text, when, when God was talking to the disciples, he was saying, come to me all ye who are uh, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now when you read the text in its context, God was saying, come to me, which means God has already given you the power to come to him. So even when we make appeals to the church, when we say those who want to accept Jesus as their personal savior, 
understand that it is not out of your power that makes you stand up on your seat. But God has already given you the power for you to come to the seat. And that is why we even have testimonies of people who says, I've never attended church, but somehow I had a voice in my home. That's why I came to church. It's not because of the sermon you are preaching. It's simply because God has empowered me. Because when God chooses you, he chooses you from all over the world and he would empower you to make sure you achieve the object. And Paul continues, he says, how shall they preach unless they've been sent? Because when you've been sent, you've been empowered. You are able to preach in season and out of season. That you do not let even circumstances uh, 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 hinder you. You know, with the virtual worship that we've been going through, I'm yet to see a testimony of people who've been baptized. Maybe it's going to happen. I do not know. But one thing I do know, that God makes a way out of nowhere. That whatever God needs to be achieved, it will be achieved. God can even use the wrong people to do the right thing. If you know the story of Balaam and Balak, where, where, where the donkey spoke, where have you ever heard a donkey speaking? But the donkey prophesied, meaning that God is more powerful than when we ever imagined. Sometimes I think our biggest problem, even especially Adventists, is that we have not yet tapped into that power. We've always seen that power as something negative, where God can make things happen out of nowhere. You know, even our testimonies sometimes, not that I'm judging people's testimonies, but sometimes I like to listen. And I wish after COVID and as we are freely able to worship, that we can have a service, more service of testimonies of what God has done for us through COVID times. Because I believe that as much in the, in the midst of death, that have been happening around us, but God has still been working. And God has been working so powerfully that now what is waiting is for us to testify that God indeed is at work. And then Paul continues, he says, unless they've been sent, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news uh, and glad tidings. Now, when Paul was taking that, he picks it up from the book of Isaiah. Now, in the book of Isaiah, especially Isaiah chapter, uh, it's Isaiah, there in Isaiah chapter, where, where is my notes now? Oh, okay, it's fine. Isaiah chapter 10. When Isaiah was prophesying, I believe that is Isaiah chapter 10. Yes. I believe. Might be wrong, but I believe that's the thing. Oh, Isaiah chapter uh, 28, yes, from the chapter 28. Now, now when, when Paul was taking that, when, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, we've always believed that the word gospel, it was a word that was found in the New Testament. Are we still together? We've always said, that is why the four gospels, we always say uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We've always said those are the gospels. Now, now the word gospel it just evangelion, it means uh, good news. Now, 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 now for, 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 for history majors, people who understand history. Now, during the world wars of this world, the first world war and the second world war, now, it didn't have what we have today, where you have ENCA, SAPC, uh, what is the other news channel? ETV, and this other new one, Newsroom Africa, CNN, and all those. Then they didn't have those. And most people, that their, their information, they relied upon through radio. Radio was the most important entertainment tool, especially from the turn of the 20th century, uh, the 1910, 1920, 1930. I mean, TV uh, only came here in South Africa in the late 70s. But even then, People were still into radio. And funny enough, even me, I love radio more than I watch TV. Because I think listening is a skill. If you can master listening, you don't even have to believe you can see. Because don't believe everything you see. Because things can be manipulated. What you hear is much more important than what you see. Because, you know, ah, this was not in my message, I'm just diverting. The biggest problem we have, especially even with the children, what I've seen, 
is that they are relying so much on what they see rather than what they hear that they are struggling with simple things of understanding. Because when you don't able to listen and you see things, because this is a generation that watches a lot of TV, that even a child that is old as three years old, they are able to manage a gadget that they, they know. I mean, as an old person, you struggle with your gadget. But you give it to a three-year-old, they'll give you everything. They'll, they'll, they'll unpack it. Now, the biggest problem with that is that the children that rely much on seeing, it is a generation that has less faith. Mm. Yeah. Are you still with me? Yeah. No, 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 no. Faith is the substance of things not yeah. seen. So that is why we are raising a generation of atheists. Because they will tell you, in order for me to believe something, I have to what? If I don't see it, which means it does not exist. That is why they will even ask you, have you seen God? And the Bible says, test and see that the Lord is good. Meaning, you have to experience Him. And to experience something, you don't have to see it to experience. It's a matter of listening. Even Christ says, my, my sheep, they know me because they can hear my voice. Not that they can see me. They can hear my voice. Because even when you read Psalms 23, you know, when, when he says, though, even though I walk through the shadow, in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. Because as the shepherds were living, leading the sheep in the valley of death, through the shadow of the valley of death, the shepherd only had to speak. Because shepherd had a specific voice, specific intonation, specific words that the shepherds would say. And the sheep would just follow the word, the voice. They would know that this is my shepherd. I'm following him. And so that is why when David says, even though I walk, I might not see you, but I know you're with me. Because your voice, it comforts me. So, 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 anyway. That, that was a, uh, by the way. Now, now, we're, 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 in the world wars, people used to listen to the rain. Now, when the good news came, or when the First World War ended, or the Second World War, people used to sit near the radio stations, you know, because the radio, it symbolizes not just entertainment, but it was a symbol of good news. They knew that by every time they listened to the news uh, at one o'clock, whatever time, at every hour, they would sit and listen, because whatever came out of there was the good news. So, so when, when the Bible talks about the good news, it was simply talking about the word that the person brings about liberation. Now, when, when, when Isaiah took that, he was prophesying about what would happen in Babylon. Now, as at first, I spoke about the three Hebrew boys who were in the belly of the beast. You still remember? Now, in the belly of the beast, Babylon, as much as things were not horrible for the Jewish people in Babylon, but they were still under captivity. And, and, and they never lived in the city. In fact, the, 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 the Hebrews, just like they did in Egypt, they never lived in Alexandria, in the capital of Egypt, but they lived in Goshen. They had their own thing. So, so, so that is why, even when you read uh, Psalm 37, there by the rivers of Babylon, the certain where, when you remember Zion, yeah, they used to sit, not in the city, but they used to live in the outskirts, because they didn't really want to be in there. So, so, so now, when you don't live in the capital, when things happen, you are the last person to know. Because things happen in the capital, and in those days, like I said, they did not have the radio, they did not have the news channels, they didn't have these things. So they only depended on runners, people who, who would run from the capital and go to where people are, those who are in the outskirts. So, 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 so when Isaiah was writing this, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Now, when Babylon fell, now, you would understand that Babylon did not fall under the sword. There was never invasion of the Persian army in Babylon. In fact, when you read Daniel chapter 5, where the, 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 the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, he took the, the, the vessels from, 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 from Israel and he was drinking of it, and then the finger wrote on the wall, right? Are we still together? Now, as that was happening, the Persian army came, they killed Belshazzar, and the kingdom fell. Now, when the kingdom fell, there were runners in the capital who saw that and the first thing they did and when you read in the Hebrew the runners were in the feminine 
which means it was the women. So when they saw the Babylon has fallen, the first thing they did was run to where the people of God were. Because when the people of God, now when the runners came, there were people on the watchtower. You know when it says they were being the watchmen on the towers of Zion, you see things coming from the far. So when the people, the watchers saw that way, we are seeing this lady running. And even the way she's running, it means whatever she has, it has good news. So when God says, when I'm sending you, I am not just sending you with nothing, but I'm bringing you good news. Meaning, whenever you send the word, even as people come or see you from the far, they see that the way you are walking, the way you are living, the way you are carrying yourself, what you are bringing is good news that this world will be liberated. Because our message as Adventists, depicted there in Revelation chapter 14, God says our mandate is to preach to the whole world that Babylon has fallen. This is what should maintain, put in our mind. We should not be worried about how you wear as a woman or what is modesty or what all of those things. I'm not saying they are not important. They are important. But what should uh, occupy our minds is telling people the good news that Babylon is falling because Jesus is coming again. Because once we start telling people about the coming Savior, then people will prepare themselves for the soon coming. It will be a shame, as I'm closing, it will be a shame if we do not take the good news. Because some of us have been sent, but we are not preaching. Some of us are supposed to be preaching, but we are not being sent. But God says, when I am sending you to the world, how shall they preach? unless they've been sent. How beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news of salvation. It's another thing that you won't have to worry about rejection. You won't even be rejected because when you carry good news, everybody would want to be with you because you're carrying good news. You know, the good news was, was, was telling people that the war is over. Consequently, as I'm sitting down, I've taken it off. In... Um, in Russia, after the end uh, of the after the end of the Second World War, we, we, we had what you call the Cold War. That was a, a war between the West and Russia and the Soviets and the communists. So because they believed that now we were entering the nuclear age, because America had just dropped the nuclear in Nagasaki. So Russia, China, North Korea they also had acquired the, the nuclear weapons. So America, Britain, the Allies, they also had nuclear weapons. So the world became a very sensitive place because now they were working through spies. So from the late, uh, after the Second World War ended in 1945, so from 1950 all the way, even the, the Cold War ended around the late 80s. So the world was on edge because the, it, it, was a, it was a time where spies were operating. You had the Russian spies going to America. You had American spies going to, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a crazy time. It's a, in fact, if you've read, read books about the Cold War, it's fantastic. I think it's better than the world wars we went through because it's just so blood. But this one was not blood. It was just a war of minds and skill and guile and everything. Now, now, as soon as the World War ended, the Second World War, we went to the Cold War. Now, there was a Russian young man who felt that, hey, man, I don't want to go through this, the World War. So, he thought there was going to be a Third World War. So, he ran into the forest. Young man, in his late teens, 19, because soldiers then, they would testify for those who, you, as soon as you were 16, you would enlist into the military. So he was a young man, understanding the times he ran into the forest and he lived there. So as he lived, imagine he lived in the forest, he was in his late teens around the 1950s, lived in the forest. Somehow he survived. He, he was able to eat the rabbits and whatever. You know, when you need to survive, you do anything to survive. So this young man survived from 1950, 1960. 1970 and then when the world the cold war ended when the russian war uh, especially in germany 
You remember in, in 1989 when that Berlin Wall fell, it was a signal of the end of the Cold War. Now, there were, uh, now from people from Germany, the world was now open. So these young people went into the forest because it was a forest that nobody had experienced. You know these young white guys, sometimes they're too adventurous. Sometimes they'll jump off the cliff and go somewhere you never know. So, 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 so they went. So as soon as they went into the forest, they noticed that, hey, they found a shed, they saw that this, somebody lives here. So they waited. And then as they waited, this guy came from hunting fish. He's an old man, not a beard, white hair, you know, he's just tired. So they talked to him, they said, hey, what are you doing here? How long have you been here? And then he says, well, I ran uh, as soon as the Cold War or the threat of the Third World War started, I ran into the forest. Now in the forest I had no radio, I had no good news, I had no satellite. I mean in the 1950s things were bad. And I've been living here because I've been scared of the Third World War. So I thought that I, by being here, I'll be safe from the nuclear whatever. So I mean, so the young people, they came to him and said, Well, sir, we are happy to tell you that the world never went to Third World War. Mm. In fact, the, world, the war is finished. In fact, you didn't even need to run into the, to the bush because there was no war. Now imagine the regret, the shame, the wasted years. He wasted close to 30 years of his, year, of his life being separated from the people. It took young people who, who were bold enough to go into the jungle and find him. Because according to the records, he went missing. They didn't know what happened. He didn't, they didn't find his tomb, nothing. Because he'd been living. So what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, let us not be like this man who in the fear of what to come ran away. But we are supposed to be one going into the jungle and telling people that, ladies and gentlemen, the war is ended. Jesus is coming. Babylon fell. And now we are liberated. And because of that, God says, how beautiful are the feet of those who carry the news of uh, justice and peace. May God bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.